am very pleased to welcome Daniel Knopf, the creator of Carnival, screenwriter, TV show writer, showrunner, comic book writer, raconteur, as we shall soon see. Um, welcome, Daniel. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me, how the heck did that come to be? Carnival, this wonderful, weird, I love that show when it was on. Um, it's everything I love in a show. How did that come to be? It's, uh, well, I mean, that's not the kind of thing you just come up with. I mean, oop. I just realized I didn't turn on your mic. Check, 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 check. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not the kind of idea you just have all at once, unless you're like a, you know, patient in a mental hospital. Um, I, I, I was like a whole bunch of things. It was over the course of like years. I've always been, um, I've always wanted to, I wanted to do something that was epic. I wanted, and uh, epic stories, you know, Lord of the Rings, all those things. I, I was a big fan of, of, you know, War and Peace, and, and all those things about, you know, good and bad, bad, you know, good and evil. And uh, like big canvas stories, giant canvas stories. So I knew I wanted to do something like that. And uh, and um, the I remember the second point of like inspiration was uh, I was up early for a walk in a, a local park. I was living in Glendale at the time, and I was walking through this park, and there was a carnival there, and it wasn't open yet. It was early in the morning, and. Uh, I saw these people and they were like sleeping under the trucks. <laughs> and I was, I was going, wow, you know, th these guys don't clock in. They like, this is, this is like a lifestyle. And it seemed, I mean, this is what, I don't know, 19, uh, this is around 2000, around the turn of the century. <laughs> and I was, I was I, but I was sort of like, this just seems incredibly romantic that this still exists, that you just move around with, with the show. And, and that, I thought, so Carnival came into it, Carnival, it was the idea of a carnival. And, and uh, I think the last piece, I, I, I had originally I was thought of thinking about it, doing it as a post-apocalyptic story about a carnival. And then, and then I, I ah, there's so many post-apocalyptic shows, you know? And then I thought about the, I thought about the, the, the you know, we've, we're a young country, the United States, and so, you know, we don't have a lot of grist for the mill as far as mythology goes. Um, and it's not, I mean, you look at Japan, and there's this incredible history, and they can draw on so many parts of it, and Europe, and uh, you know, with the Lord of the Rings and all that, right? The only thing we've mythologized, at least to the point where we were doing this, really kind of was, was uh, the Old West, and that had become our sort of template for mythology and stories of good and evil. And um, I thought, you know what, there's a little, we've, you know, we've moved on a little bit further. And, and I was fascinated by that period between World War I and World War II that was, you know, basically, World War I, a lot of people say World War I and World War II was just one war with an intermission, you know, but, um, the, you know, we could have gone either way. I mean, we, there were Nazi rallies at Madison Square Gardens, you know, and uh, German Bund was very big, and the KKK was like, you know, it was like a mainstream organization in the 30s, and so we, you know, if we'd flipped, uh, if we'd flipped towards the Axis rather than the Allies, um, it's a pretty good chance that would have turned the outcome of the war, and then, you know, you can all tune into the, was it, the Man in the High Tower, you know. Um, so I thought, you know, this is this was a critical time, and I, I thought this is uh, this is interesting. This is better than post-apocalyptic. And then the last thing was uh, the idea of magic, and um, that you know the the idea of telling the story of the end of magic, and and uh, the premise being that you know as soon as we created um, as a species, as soon as we created this this false Sun over Alamogordo, the Trinity test site, that God just sort of flipped us the car keys and said, hey, you're on your own now, you know? And I, I kind of wanted to make that part of the story is just the death of magic and, the and, and you know, that when science supplanted magic. And so uh, all those things kind of went into a big old hopper. And I tried to write it as a script because I wasn't a TV writer. At the time, I was trying to write scripts. 
And I wrote it as a feature, and I realized I just, you know, it's too much story, too much, too big. And I think I had like a 240-page draft, <laughs> and I realized that I'm, I wasn't even out of the second act, and oh my God, I'm in so much trouble. And so then I set it aside, and then um, I met some guys at a Writers Guild um, retreat, and they were TV writers. They were working, guys, a bunch of X Files guys, and they were telling about the X Files, and I was going, yeah, high diddly D, this TV life for me, that sounds great, you know? Um, and, uh, and I said, so what is a TV thing shaped like? I mean, what is, oh yeah, there's six acts, and there's a teaser, and there's this, and there's that. And, you know, I, I call, I got one of their numbers, and I called him, and he very, we walked me through this, this basically the act structure. And so I thought, okay, so I took the first act of this ginormous screenplay I'd written, and I turned it into a pilot. And then I thought, you know, at the time, I'm like in my mid-40s. And I think, hey, I'm looking at TV, breaking into TV in my mid-40s. You know, these guys, it's kids, you know, coming into this. And what, what was I thinking about, you idiot? Like, I'm going to create a show in my mid-40s, and I've come out of nowhere. That's so dumb. Yeah. And where, were you, where were you coming out of? Like, where were you before that? I mean, I was an insurance broker. I mean, I'm working as a, I was, I had a, I had a company. I was working as an insurance broker. I was setting up health plans for schools like this. I was setting up their health plans. And uh, I was writing at night, Tuesday and Thursday nights after the kids went to bed. And... Um, and I thought, yeah, you're delusional. So I put it in the drawer again, and it sat in the drawer for a while. And then I, uh, this was in the mid 90s, really. And then I, I finally, I created a website. I, I hit this point, I sold a script called um, Blind Justice. And they went and they made it. It was a Western. Guys, if you ever get a chance to make a Western, make a Western, because a, a Western is such a movie, you know? <laughs> you got all your actors on the set and they're practicing with their guns and there's guys with horses and there's stuntmen that are missing fingers and it's, it's fantastic. You gotta, you gotta do a Western. And so it was a Western called Blind Justice with uh, Armand Desante and Robert Davi and Elizabeth Shue and they end up making this thing. I went out to the set and I was looking at the set and I was all excited because I was, wow, wow, I'm making my movie, you know? And, you know, these famous people are all my meat puppets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and, and then I thought, well, you know, uh, then the, the idea creeps in your head. I go, what if this is the last time? What if this is the only thing? Like, what if I'm a total one-trick pony? And, it never, and it, like most things, it, that came true. It's like, after that, it didn't work. I, I mean, I had, I had a development deal briefly with, with, with 20th Century Fox for a, another project, and then pff, that went. And so I was sitting there going, wow, I gotta do something. So I set up a website called unmovies.com. And I figure I'm just, you know, rather than leaving behind writing samples, there's this new thing, this new cool thing called the interwebs. And I'll create a site. And I had some graphic arts experience and some programming experience because I've done, I run a business and done websites. And I put the first acts of like everything I'd done, every script I'd ever done. And I got a call like, three months afterwards um, from a guy who says, hey, uh, I work for this, uh, I work for this director producer, he wants to read the rest of your script. And I said, uh, yeah, okay, which one? And it was this Caraval, oh, well, okay. Um, so I sent him the rest of the script and then they had me into their office and, um, you know, I realized, okay, well, this is my, you know, lightning striking twice, I'd had my, I'd, I kind of come in and bounced off the stratosphere with the Western, and so now I got to go in. And when I go in, I got to go in with, you know, I got to bring my A game here. And so I just took. It's like I'm gonna, just going to impress the crap out of these people. And they said, "Well, we need a Bible." And I'm thinking, is, "Can I? Is this yeah. Ronald D. Moore?" And is that? Or no, no, not Ronald D. Moore. This is this is Scott Wynette. Scott Wynette is an Emmy-winning producer. Um, they once listed the 100 best episodes of TV ever, and he directed two of them. So he's, he's an amazing director, producer. Um, and so I'm sitting there with Scott, and he says, we need a Bible. And I go, well, doesn't everybody, <laughs> you know? And uh, I said, what's a Bible? And he told me what a Bible was. And tell them what a Bible so a Bible is basically the way he told it. 
is okay, you get all the characters, there's character descriptions, there's plot arcs, various, various story arcs, um, the world, talk about the world, talk about this, talk about that. Um, uh, the, and then, you know, like, like episodes, you know, little episodic pieces. And so I started writing this thing, and, um, and I, I got about halfway, I got a ways into it, and I just said, God, this is just boring. <laughs> I mean, this is the worst kind of thing. I mean, to me, I, one of the, it's like, uh, it's like talking about sex. You know, it's, it's like, it's like, no, it's like sex is great. Talking about sex, you know, and talking about what you're going to write, talking about what's going to, uh, that's boring. I mean, it, and it even takes the fun out of writing it later. And I, I hated the whole process. And it was worse, it was boring. I think I'm the guy who's trying to sell it. I'm the closest person. I've got more and more skin in the scheme than anybody. And if I'm bored, they're going to be like, this may kill them. They may die reading this document. <laughs> so I just threw everything away, and I took another attack, and I said, OK, I'm going to put together this thing that's like as if it really happened, as if this happened in history. And so I sort of wrote it from the point of view of some like college professor who had been looking into this weird carnival that had been moving through the Dust Bowl in the 30s, and I had like fake police reports. I had fake newspaper articles, fake religious tracts. I just built this whole thing out, and um, and then that became the bylaw. And I handed it in. And I had because I had the graphic arts experience, and all you guys, you know, have some talent in that regard. Or if you don't, you are friends with somebody with some talent in that regard. And so, and these people don't like to read; they like pictures. Because if they read too much, their you know their lips get tired, <laughs> and there and so I had pretty pictures. I had lots of really, and that it, when it went to HBO, they'd never seen anything like it. That is like, and I had to be like, well, you, nobody told us this really happened. That this was based on real events. And it's like, <laughs> you suckers. <laughs> and so uh, so so there it was. Now everybody does that. Now that's what you're competing with. Um, but back then, it was sort of like uh, nobody had done that, and um, and so uh, then they they greenlit it, and then the rest is sort of history. So that's the story of Carnival. It's part of the story of Carnival, right? Because well, then it becomes I, the a rest collaborative of it's thing, right? Right? You're now you're working with all of these other people. Yeah, that was a weird experience. Well, I I while I, I sold Carnival, my agent says. Oh well, there's this new show that's going to be on CBS, or it's, it's this new show that's going to be on TBS, and and they want you, they want to talk to you because I already sold Carnival. So now when you've sold one, everybody thinks, you know, okay, well, you know, it's like you know, all of a sudden you're viable, you know, <laughs> and, and so I go into this meeting and they show me, they go, we, you know, this guy, uh, what's his name, Alex, uh, he. Good guy, good writer. Um, uh, I'm I just I'm blanking on his last name though, and um, so uh, I he says, well, you know, we got the 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 pilot, and they showed me the pilot, and I watched it, and it was about werewolves in this little town, and it was called Wolf Lake. And it was an awful pilot, just awful, <laughs> you know. And so I did what I always do, you know. I don't try to anticipate what they want to hear. Just tell the truth. If something sucks, say it sucks. If something, you know. And I mean, uh, with some caveats. But uh, you know, like one of my favorite things to say if something really sucks is, you know, I can't tell you how much I love that. <laughs> um, so, I, I, but instead I said, yeah, that's, that's just one long first act and I have no idea what's going on with it. You know, it's, it, was an, it, was most, it was an inept thing. He says, yes, it is, so we're gonna rewrite it. And then, okay, and um, so he said, I'm, I'm calling your agent right now, we wanna hire you. So that was actually my first gig, was this Wolf Lake gig. And so I, he calls my agent, and my agent calls me back. He says, you got the gig, you got the gig. And then you're thinking, TBS. I mean, that's like, whoa, I might win the East Award, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and TBS, and, and I go, wow, so it's TBS. He goes, no, it's CBS. And I'm thinking, 
oh wow, I'm on a CBS show, I'm on a broadcast network show, that's kind of cool. And, and so I got this job and I'm sitting there in this room and I'm going, wow, I sure hope I can hold my own, you know? I mean, these are all pros, they, you know, I'm in my first writer's room and oh, wow, you know? And I, and, uh, you know, so I'm listening, you know, as my dad used to say, God gave you two ears, he only gave you one mouth, kid. Because uh, I'm talking now, so. <laughs> I'll be listening to you later. But uh, so I, I, I was sitting in this room and I was like, these guys kind of suck. <laughs> I mean, I was actually kind of shocked, at, not only at how kind of crappy the, 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 the level of writing was, but just how much they weren't into it. I, you know, and, and, I, and, and so is, that, was an interesting, that was an interesting learning experience. Um, so I was on that for a little while. Um, what, do you, what do you think was your big takeaway from that? if you've worked with these people? Uh, my big takeaway from that is it's like being on a professional baseball team. There's a few guys that are stars and there's a few people that just, you know, they're in the middle somewhere and they just aren't gonna get any better. I think the biggest problem with TV and people in TV is, and I'm coming into the party, I'm, for, I'm in my mid-40s. I've got, I've got three kids. I've had one who was diagnosed with diabetes. I went through that, you know, I've had I've dealt with sickness and death, and, and, and I've, had, I've got a lot of life under my belt. And I mean, I, you know, I, when I was younger, I mean, I did a lot of crazy sh shit. I mean, I, you know, going out and hitchhiking, you know, having some guy offer me a hundred bucks to let him sit on my feet to Phoenix. I mean, that kind of crap. <laughs> I mean, crazy stuff. And so I, mean, I had lived a life. I had a life. And so I had a, I had a deep story well. And, and so a lot of these people come into it, they come right out of their Ivy League college and then they go right into it. They become a writer's assistant and they become a story editor and then they become a writer and then they're on a staff somewhere and they have no, they've only, they have not lived outside the bubble and all they know is what they've seen on TV or in the movies. All they've, they've, whatever they've seen on a screen, their sense of, and so, the, and it shows because the stuff that comes out of them is like a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. It doesn't feel like it was, it's first generation, you know, experience. And so, and, and uh, you know, it's not like you always are writing about your own life, but your, your life is informing what you're writing. And, um, you know, there's things I would say, don't, you know, spend at least four or five years living before you try to jump into this thing. You, you just don't have anything to say when you're 21 years old. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> for the most part, the, 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 I'm making a gross generalization. I'm sure there's people who have, 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 have dealt with, you know, crazy stuff. But then again, at a certain age, you have a certain distance, too. Um, and so, I mean, I'm really glad I, I, was, I was in my mid-40s when I broke in. Um, just because I knew I would die before I got jaded. <laughs> it's the coolest. <laughs> I drive onto a studio a lot, and it's like, they wave me in, you know. Oh, yeah. Hey, hello, Mr. Knopf. And you go, and it's like, I can't believe I got in. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, that's kind of cool. You know, I won't ever be, you know, like, oh, you know, you didn't park my car right. You know? <laughs> um, so, but I have, you know, and I mean, uh, you look at uh, act, you look at storytellers, they're late bloomers like Charles Bukowski and people like that, and they have these incredibly deep story wells, and they've got a lot of material to draw on uh, from their own lives, and I think that the story. It's like something that bubbles up. It's not, it doesn't, it bubbles up through this well and it's, it, it, you don't really know. Like I can't tell you how many things I've written where I went, where the hell did that come from? You're like, what is that? But it's, it's colored by your own story well. And what comes out of that is something akin to a fingerprint. It's very much yours. Nobody else could have written this the way Nobody could have told the story the way you're telling the story. And that's always much more interesting than this corporate pablum we see coming down the pike that represents about 95% of what you see on TV, where you go, okay, well, she's gonna have leukemia, you know? <laughs> I drive my wife nuts. We were watching, <laughs> we were watching the show and I go, and, and I, we're watching the kids in there and, and I go, okay, in two more scenes, that kid is gonna be diagnosed with leukemia. Just watch. <laughs> and then like two, you know, I'm sorry to say that your child has, and then she's just bam, 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 you know? 
Um, but it's, you know, so much of this stuff is it's it's predictable. It's not it's it's false. Most of it's false. People say things they would never say in real life, ever. How many times do you see somebody where they uh, where they you know it drives me crazy? Nobody says goodbye on the phone. <laughs> Nobody ever says bye. I mean, everybody you have to say bye for people to know the, but nobody does. Did those prints come back? We got a, we got a, oh good, prints came back, positive. Like, I'm got nobody, <laughs> I keep picturing the pathologist going, hello? <laughs> I have more to tell you, I gotta call him back. Things you see on TV where people, I was talking to my son, I was watching Lord of the Rings. I mean, I don't know if you're into Lord of the Rings or not into Lord of the Rings, but I'm watching Lord of the Rings and these, these people are on a boat and they're just standing on a boat and they're going across the sea and they're all staring at mid distance, you know, it's all the elves and they're on the boat. And I'm thinking, and then they cut away and they do a couple scenes and they cut to the boat and the elves, it's like four days later and they're on the boat. Right? <laughs> and I'm just going, what, who, what, don't they play cards? I mean, don't they tell stories? Who does that? Who stands in a boat? I, I figure every scene you write, you should know what's that character doing just before that scene started and what happens after. You know, you got Galactics and Galactus and he's sitting on his throne, he's like, you know, go kill them all, draw blood, rivers of blood, and then, yes, yes, off they go, and what's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, that kind of stuff is so stupid. I just can't. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I've answered your question. I don't even know if I've answered I don't your question. The question but I'm I have no idea. How could it not have? Uh, <laughs> um, so, I digress. <laughs> yes. So I think, uh, given the wonderful fullness of your answers, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the students so we can at least get two of them in here. Yeah, you got one question in. <laughs> I just went on. I went off. That's what, that's what I love. That's what I make. Okay. Love. Well, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, ask go away. Ahead. So uh, students of ours, students of the Raymond College of Art Plus Design, uh, who's got a question for Daniel Knopf? All right. Um, someone want to come and do this one? Oh, I can do it. I'll do it. Hello? Oh. I don't, does this one work? Yeah, this one works. All right. You want to do it? I'll just wait I feel like I'm an Oprah. You are, actually. Well, you spoil the surprise. You uh, can tell Oprah to go home. Yes. <laughs> All right. So if a lot of your um, ideas come from having lived uh, a full life, we're all kind of getting art degrees. How should we like get that experience with the degrees that we have and the job opportunities that are currently open to us? I think the best way to do it is to spend as much time as you can, and you're doing it because you're here, spend as much time as you can with interesting people. Okay. You know, with interesting ideas, whose minds are wired in a different way than yours. Um, and uh, fall in love multiple times. Spend a night in jail. I think that's important. <laughs> Do a shitload of drugs. No, I didn't say that. No, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> just, just, just when you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, somebody comes to you and you go, ah, I'm driving, I'm driving across the country, and uh, I need somebody to, I got to make the trip, and I need somebody, to, I need, I need some, I need somebody in shot, to ride shotgun and, and to drive when I'm driving, and you're going, well, I, you know, I didn't plan on this. Say yes. Just do crazy things. I mean, not things that are going to get you killed, or things that are going to get you arrested if possible. But uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I uh, look. I mean, I, I went to jail once, but it was for it was for traffic warrants. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting in jail with a guy, and I'm saying, well, everybody's going, "What are you in for? What are you in for? What are you in for?" And I'm going, "Oh shit! I hope they don't get to me." You know, <laughs> traffic warrants. <laughs> yeah. Some guy's in there, he's like, yeah, I stabbed a guy with a ballpoint pin in the eye. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> he's the king of the, king of the cell block now. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow. But it just, just, just take chances, do things. But, but like I said, I think the most important people thing is spending time with people. And as people might, might be your own family. Listen to their stories. Get their history. Figure out you know, where you came from. You know, all those things go into the story well, you know? But just live. Next question. Love, love and understanding. You know, it seem like it's on. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
okay, that's my main thing. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's a prop. It's a total prop now. Yeah, yeah. for speaking. You skills. can speak into my. Just come over here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll like, I'll like, I'll like pat his it's not head. It's not yeah. Talk loud. Okay, I can do that. So I'll um, repeat his question. Uh, I know that Carnival got canceled before its like main amount of seasons that were projected. How do you do sort of a damage control to tell a full story? That I know it's not what you envisioned, but to make it as good as you can make it. And is there any way to like? eventually salvage that story or is it just locked up in legality? Like there is. Story? Yes, okay. there is. The, the, I'd, say, I'd say if you're, if you're creating it, you can separate rights to begin with. The problem with Carnival is I don't own it. People come to me and they go, oh, make a great, why don't you finish it off with graphic novels or why don't you write a series of novels? And it's like, I don't own the characters. I don't own anything. HBO, HBO, Hollywood, they're pigs. They, they're pigs. They're like, they're like the most spoiled, rotten brat in the sandbox, man. It's like, I own all the toys, and I can only play with one at a time, but, but you can't play with any of the toys that I'm not playing with. That's Hollywood. And um, I mean, the other one I like to say is it's like, uh, Hollywood is like, is like playing Mother May I with like Mommy Dearest. <laughs> you know? But, uh, but the, but the, the um, but that's what they do. They buy up all the rights, and they have, they have no intention of developing those rights. They have no intention of doing a series of novels or graphic novels, but they, they sell them up anyway. Now we own them. Okay, so, you know, when Carnival got canceled, I had Marvel coming to me, and they're going, we want to do Carnival, comic book. We want to continue the story in, in graphic novel form. I'm going, oh, that sounds great. I call all the actors. How do you feel about having your, you know, really giving us releases for your images? You know, oh yeah, that'd be great. We're good. And line everything up. I call up HBO, and they go, nah. <laughs> because if the comic book's really successful, that's going to make us look like monkeys. So it's not enough money for us. It's pocket. It's walking around money. The, the licenses, license fees on that shit, it's nothing. It's 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 pennies. They don't care. Um, so you know what you can do though is you can basically. Um, separate the rights by taking the, the thing that you're creating and you can either publish it, post it as a thing on the internet, you know, um, and then, you know, it's been published in another form. Now they have to license that from you. And so you've separated the rights. Or make it a graphic novel. Get together with one of your artists. Uh, you friends. Before you make the show. Yeah, absolutely. Do the entire thing as a graphic novel with one of your artist buddies. You don't have to do the whole entire th series. You can just do the, the pilot as a graphic novel. You've just separated rights. You've separated all the rights for those characters. Now you own them and they're licensing them from you instead of them owning them lock, stock, and barrel. So there are some things you can do from a business standpoint. And I learned that by accident on another project called Honey Vaccaro. So, um, and I've tried to do that as much as possible since. But often what I'm brought, what, what's brought to me now is stuff that's already owned by somebody and they want me to develop it. So I'm doing work for hire. I hope there's more questions. There must be. Did I answer your question in full? It was sort of a two-parter. Yeah. Did, did I get it? Okay. Let's go here in the uh, strawberries. Lucky for you, I'm a really loud talker as well. Uh, so. You're talking about so many cool different things. I have actually seen your website, and I saw on it that you have a good variety of like unseen projects, like projects that haven't gone on. How do you sort of come back from like having that pitch like be denied, or sort of like get the inspiration to move on to another project? Is there like a yeah. part of you that like stays with the previous project, or like? You, you, you know, you never really do. These things, especially when you're doing it for a company. I mean, we were talking about, um, I think, uh, we were talking at dinner earlier about what would you do in there, the project called Sleepers. That I, developed with, I developed that with uh, Wes Craven. And um, I, that was a year and a half. That's 18 months of my life that I put into the, I wrote a pilot. And I, wrote, I did a version, and believe it or not, I actually was hired by Constantine to do Resident Evil. And so there's an entire version of Resident Evil that I created that when Netflix did it, they said, nah. And then they just did their thing. And we all know how well that turned out. <laughs> um, 
and so that was you know it's a year and a half of your life, and you do it. You're the only thing is you're very you know, you're very well compensated, you know. I mean, I mean it's like you know at this at this point I can command a fairly big fee for my work, which you know it's great, but that's not why I'm doing it. That's not, I, if I was doing that, I'd still be in the insurance business. So I was making great money as an insurance broker, you know. Um, I mean, here, I mean, I, my mom, God bless her, she was a wonderful person, but she was, didn't have a diplomatic bone in her body. And so, this is something, you know, you find with families, family better, better take an accounting class, <laughs> you, know? And, you know, it's hard to make a living in art, you know, like, no, yeah, I know. Um, but my mom, I remember telling her, you know, look, I, I want to be a writer, I want to write stuff, and, and she says, what makes you think anybody wants to hear what you have to say? <laughs> and I mean, you know, that's, that's cold. I mean, that's kind of crushing. It's harsh. But it's a legitimate question. It's like I was saying, wow, it's kind of egotistical of me, isn't it? You know? And, and I, I, I used to revisit that question from time to time. And I'd think, what makes me do what I'm doing? And what makes me do what I'm doing is, is there's so many things, so much art, so many beautiful paintings, so many beautiful stories, so many beautiful songs that have been written that I cannot thank them. They, they have that literally influenced the course of my life. You know, moments that have actually prompted decisions I might have not made otherwise because I, I was exposed to this particular piece of art. And, and, and part of that is who I am. Is, and, and I, you just, I've been really, lucky in life to meet some of the people who wrote that stuff. And I've been able to say, wow, I'm such, I'm such a fan. And um, that's great, but uh, you know, I, most of them are dead, and I'll never meet them. And so it's like, this is, this is why I do it. I, I want to pay it forward. I want to basically have that kind of a impact on other people's lives and, 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 and press that on. And, and, and see if, have them excited about what happens next. Like I was excited about what happens next. And, and uh, so if it's not landing on eyeballs, it is landing on eyeballs. It's landing on like, like you know, there's seven executives, seven clowns who are sitting there seeing all this work and they're going, eh, nah. <laughs> that, that's not the. That's not why I got into this business, you know. Nah, but here's a big check, you know. It's like, ah, you know. So yeah, that it's 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 hard. Yeah, it, but it's so good when it happens. It, it's it's. I think I look. I would say you you have to ask the same question to uh, a guy who's a gold prospector. It's like, how often does the hole come up with no gold? It's like, that's pretty crushing. I spent a year and a half digging that hole. And then one day, you know, you just kick the ground and there's some glitter and you pick it up and there it is. And you're going, wow, and it happens super easy or whatever. And then and it's giddy, giddy crazy. You know, when they start making these things and you're just, it was in your head, and now it's that. The first time was with the Western. I remember going to the Western, and, and I had my family out to the set, and there was a, it was a four-wall church set. We're going to blow it up. We're going to blow this church up. And we did blow the church up. <laughs> and blew it to smithereens. We broke windows like three miles away. It was fantastic. But there was a church, four-wall set, and I'd, I'd been on the phone with my wife telling her all about this. It's the set and how amazing it was detailed. It was by, by, by four wall, it means there's an inside that's dressed too. It's like a full, it was a fully functioning with a choir loft. And if you went in, all the, all the guys, it was all dressed inside, okay? And so um, I was describing it. And so we, she, she and the kids get there and they go, oh, well, let me, we really want to see the church. We want to go in the church. Well, at that point, they had a cart parked out in front of the church, and there was no way to get in through the double doors. And, um, and, I, and she said, oh, and I said, don't worry, I wrote a side entrance. <laughs> I walk around, there's a side entrance. And it's kind of like being a paranoid schizophrenic and finding out that those black helicopters really are following you. <laughs> it, it, suddenly, this world that existed in your head, at immense expense, suddenly, somebody's built it. 
and uh, it's a pretty amazing feeling. And it's, it, I hesitate to say, but it's kind of godlike, you know. It's like it's one thing to write stuff down and it exists as pages, but it's another thing when you write the church blows up and there's like 50 people setting charges and blowing a church up, and that's like wow, you know. I should have written something even worse. <laughs> Anything, anybody else? All right, another question. There we go. Uh, you were first in my line over there. Um, so talking about the um, scripts that have not been released versus the ones that have been. You, you guys really want to pick that scab, don't you? <laughs> OK, um, yeah. Um, are there any patterns that you observe on the few ones that have been released I'm sorry. Are there any patterns in the few ones that you that have been released for air? Uh, no. 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 It, it's it's like hitting. Uh, it's like a it, it's like hitting a moving target with a crooked gun. It, it, there's uh, what goes is the thing that you didn't expect to go, and things that you think are complete no brainers. Like this is gonna. There, we're gonna have multiple offers on this. Nobody's interested. And, and these days, you know, so much of this stuff, it's like a bunch of executives sit in a room and they go, what are we looking for this week? And they got a list and they got boxes. Well, we want this, 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 and this. And if you happen to come in with something that checks off all those boxes, then, you know, you, you win the Cupid doll. So. That list, it doesn't it? matter because it's that <laughs> list is going to be different next, week. Ne different next in two days. Yeah. It, 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 there's no rhyme or reason to what they buy, and but they are one thing you can say is they'll buy. They are incredible peripheral visionaries. <laughs> they they do. They look at oh that's making money for them. That's making money for them. Lord, look, look at that Game of Thrones over here. You know, better call Saul over here. What if you had a crooked lawyer who was like a warrior? Crooked, yeah, lawyer, warrior. Good. <laughs> we'll do lawyer, warrior. I, 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 wacky shit. <laughs> you know, that, and then often the stuff that they come up with, nobody ever does. It never goes on. You just, what you have to do is you have to, you're going to have to live with this thing. If, you, if it goes, you're going to be on it. And you're going to be in charge of it. And you're going to have to live with it. And... You, you should love it. Do, do stories you love um, and make sure that, that, that you, wouldn't, you, would be, you won't be like wanting to you know, kill yourself after a year. You know? I've been on shows with showrunners that didn't even like the show they created and there's no, nobody more miserable than that. They're just stuck on this you know, crap that they, they came up with because they thought maybe it would be commercial, and it turned out it was. So just tell your own story in your own way. That's what they're looking. They're looking for unique voices right now. We had somebody over on here. In the oh. back there, all the way in the back. Yep, you in the red. Oh. Um, so again, I also uh, looked through a bunch of stuff that you've done, and my big question was, um, you did a you've done a lot of work in like other people's worlds, like Dracula, using Lovecraft stories and stuff. How do you balance um, telling your own stories while remaining true to that sort of source world that you're working in? Well, you know, it all boils down to scene work. At the end of the day, um, uh, you know, if you're if you're dealing, if you're those things. Talk about Dracula and what that show and what that was. Dracula was very weird. Dracula was a very weird situation, but. Um, I've done Dracula twice. I've done two different versions of Dracula. One's on the website, I think, and I think it's better than the one I ended up doing for NBC. Um, but uh, uh, Dracula, you got to look at the you got to look at the IP, the the intellectual property as almost like a suit of clothes. Um, it's an excuse to tell different stories and. Stories, when it comes to TV, and people get this wrong, a lot of executives, uh, they think it's just like movies, but it's not. A movie is like uh, a movie is like a one night stand. Um, you're, you're, you're just going out and that's that, just one night and that's that. You're done, that's the end of the relationship. It's that person you met at Mardi Gras, you know? Um, 
a TV show is a commitment, it's a marriage. And we invite these characters into our homes and what makes us watch TV is sometimes part of it is what's gonna happen next, you know? Um, but most importantly, you become attached to these characters. They become like your friends. They, they become, you become invested in them. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, and, and doing that in the context of Dracula is saying, okay, well, let's get a take on this character and let's ground her in people. Human. I had, on Dracula, I had, um, I had a guy who was in the room and he was a burned out writer. I won't even say his name. He was a, when he came in and it was like, yeah, I mean, he was kind of like path of least resistance. Just, okay, give him this, we'll do this, that happens. And I would, I, I would call him on it and say, nobody in the history of anything has ever done that and made it work, you know? Nobody has ever had a monologue. Nobody does monologues. I don't want to have a mon no monologues. Well, maybe you should have a talk with Mr. William Shakespeare. You know what? In real life, nobody has monologues. And anytime somebody's talking to a tape recorder or at their confession or in a, a church, that's false. That's just false. Nobody ever does that. And when we see it, we see that kind of lie on screen. We, we just, it's like, yeah, you know? They took the easy way out. What we need is scene work, two people having a conversation. That's what it's all about. And that scene work in my Dracula is gonna be very, very different than the scene work in your Dracula. And that's how it goes. So. Right. Another question. All the way over in the corner here. Do you have an idea you really believe in that you're gonna make it just don't care for? Do you have a way of fighting back against that if you fancy them, or do you just deal with it? Do you, have you ever met a, you ever met a person that you're totally in love with that isn't interested in you? <laughs> and the more you try to make them interested in you, the less interested in you they are. <laughs> That's kind of what it is. You, you know, though you can't talk them into it. You just have to come in and and now, that said, going in pitching, um, and this is how to pitch. This is the best way to pitch. If you got one takeaway from this evening, this is the best way to pitch. When I was a kid, I would tell my friends movies. I'd go see a movie and I'd be really excited about it and I'd say, oh yeah, then this happens and this happens and this happens. And they'd be going, shut up, shut up, I wanna see the movie, you're ruining it. You know, and eventually I'd have to shut up, you know, because I was spoiling it. Nobody's gonna see that in a pitch meeting. So your story is like the coolest thing you've ever seen and nobody's gonna tell you to stop telling it. So you get to tell it. So you go in there, you just say, this is so cool. And then what happens next? And if you forget something, you go, oh, oh, I totally forgot. Before that, the guy, don't worry. Tell it like you're telling your best friend a crazy movie and he's not gonna tell you, yeah, a movie you love. And nobody's gonna say, stop, you're ruining it. You know, I'm gonna go see it next week. Um, so. You know, just tell it with that kind of verve and enthusiasm. And if they don't like it, uh, you know, maybe the next one will. And if nobody seems to like it, then in the drawer it goes. And I've had many stories where somebody says, have you got anything? And I go, oh, well, what are you looking for? And they tell me what they're looking for. And I go, you know, I got something that you might be interested in reading, you know? And then, you know, six years after I came up with it, it, it sells somewhere. So that happens too. Still have time for a few more questions. Uh, and we'll go five minutes over if we could, because sure. we started five minutes late. Okay, let's go here in the pink mask. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you have been doing stuff for a long time. Yes. Um, what is it? Yeah, you're going to have to speak up a little bit. Can I borrow your mic? I don't see it. Uh, we have labs on, so. Does it work? Okay, okay. I'll be louder. Um, so, you have stuff for a couple of things. Well, I'm going to walk over to yeah. you. It's all right. <laughs> you were a stockbroker for 22 years, and then you decided to stop writing full time. Yes, I just want to make sure that I'm getting that right. No. Okay, I'm not getting. You're it right. kind of getting it right. Okay, but can you like? Walk I was an insurance broker. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's even really? less interesting than a stockbroker. <laughs> yeah. You're an insurance broker. My apologies. <laughs> Can you walk us through um, the process, like where you just decided, okay, I'm going to start like writing full time. Like, what led up to 
that decision being the final day when you were like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't just happen. Yeah. yeah, what happened was I had, I had a business. I had people who worked for me, so I couldn't just shut the doors and fire everybody. And I did, what happened was I, um, I'm going to sit down on the, um, what happened was I basically just started, uh, you know, I had this, I knew how much I was making um, doing what I did, and I knew how much my family cost me, and I knew what the mortgage was, and I knew how much the kids ate, and I knew all those things, and so it was a very tricky transition from one to the other. It was like I had one foot in two boats for a little while. Um, and I just waited until there came a point with Carnival, in fact, where, okay, I can't do the job that needs to be done for my clients without, and do that job. I can't do both these jobs. And so, but I'm being paid enough on this job over here to where I can afford to step away from that job. And by then I'd found a buyer for my company and I sold my company. So it was a, it was a, very, it was a very kind of careful transition. Um, but I, I, just, I, I just made sure that, you know, the first thing you gotta make sure, you know, I used to think, you know, it's, it, people go, um, you know, I, it's when, when I was in college and, and there'd be guys saying, well, what was he thinking? What made him write this? And what made, you know, and I'd think, you know, you don't write this. It's like, I got a deadline. I got family to feed, <laughs> so, you know? And that's really kind of what it boils down to is I had commitments I'd made in my life. And, and in order to honor those commitments, I had to make a certain amount of money. And so I, I you know, I reached a point where I could actually step into the boat and, and move out um, of the insurance business. So, yeah, it was a process. It wasn't something where I could just, oh, I wasn't go gan. I didn't just you know, <laughs> leave my wife and kids and go to the islands and start painting. I, I, I didn't, that's not, I wish I could have. <laughs> anyway. All right, we have some in the back. Yeah, they're all the way in the back. Yeah. And you said that we should like live like crazy. Did you also advise to write like crazy in every different genre? What oh yeah, write every day. Yeah, the more you write, the better you get. You got to get that 10,000 hours in. Yeah. Do right? crazy things. Do crazy things. Write whatever you want. Make sure you write something. Uh, finish everything you start. Finish everything you start. That's a good rule. Uh, I, I don't think I really was a writer till I decided to do that. Is I had a million things I'd started that I hadn't finished. So once you start something, finish it. I'm going to write a screenplay now. I'm going to write a short story now. You know, um, finish it. Um, do things that put you out there. I think the most important thing to do, if you're anybody here in the in, in wants to take a, a you know doing a tack towards screenwriting, is um, this is critical. It was critical in my my own development as a writer. Is uh, start acting, get get into an acting workshop, get a coach. Do, do acting. I mean, there's, Shakespeare was an actor. He started as an actor. There's a reason his work's so good. It gives you an idea of how hard it is. Number one, it, you get respect for actors, which I think is important. But it also teaches you how to write things actors want to say. And, you know, great lines. They want to do great lines. And, and they come from a real place. And they want subtext. And they want, you know, they want to make people laugh and cry. They want to make you know, so you, if you're, you're writing stuff that actors, scenes that actors want to play, then, you know, you're cooking with grease. Um, so the best way to get an insight into that is by getting up and even though you, you're shy and the last thing you want to do is go on stage and you, it's terrifying, is get up there and, and, and do it. And I'll tell you what, another thing, uh, this acting class, I, I was working with a, a professional coach and he would bring these scenes in. I remember sitting there with one of them and I was having trouble with it and he says, Dan, um, his name was Cliff Osmond. He was an a character actor, he had this very deep voice. And he says, Dan, what are you doing? And I said, 
this is awful. This is awful. Why is it awful? I said, because the guy, it's a detective, and he's telling the other detective what he's going to do with the evidence, and these guys are partners, and of course that detective already knows that. He's not telling the detective, he's telling the audience, and we know he's telling the audience. It's a badly written, it's a sloppily written scene that's getting exposition out in the wrong direction, you know? Well, we, you know, if you were smart, if you were a canny writer, you'd have somebody in the room who's a who's a, a raw recruit, a rank recruit, or somebody who needs to have evidentiary chains explained to them. You don't have a two detectives talking about, well, where are we gonna go next with this fingerprint? I mean, come on. And he said, that's what we get. Make it work, watch. Hands it to a, one of the real actors in the class. Guy gets up and he just blows through it. And sometimes when you're an, a writer, you have to just have exposition. You, got, you gotta have exposition just come out. And the worst thing you can do as an actor is try to act exposition. You know, you, if you run into cr crap like that and you just have to blow it out, just say it and move on, you know, and the audience will kind of accept that, you know. But if you're a really facile writer, you'll never do that, you know. You, you, it, sometimes it's hard to avoid it, but yeah, you just try to you, you try not to do that, you know. And if you do it as an as a writer, don't have it carrying any emotional freight at all. It's just something somebody's saying. It's like reading the back of an aspirin bottle, you know? Thank you. Uh, there we go, Josh. Um, how did you get your foot in the door? Was it someone that you by chance knew? Was it something you had to set up? <laughs> it's how a weird, it is, the, it is, that's a weird story. Um, the Western that I sold, um, there was a guy, his name Neil Moritz. Neil Moritz has gone on to do the Fast and Furious movies. He, at the time, was partnered with David Heyman, who did all the Harry Potter movies. So these two guys have made like billions of dollars, and none of it with anything I've written. Um, <laughs> so they know better. So, so I, anyway, Neil, I, my brother called me on the phone. He was working for a company called Principal Mutual, another insurance company, and I was an independent broker. And he says, Hey, there's this guy who wants to buy a policy. He's an individual. I said, well, I don't do individuals. I just do groups. He, you know that. He says, this guy's a movie producer. I went, oh, OK. Yeah, I'll sell him a policy. <laughs> so you know, I go in, and he, I'll meet you at Denny's, you know, outside Warner's. You know? and so we go to Denny's, buy Warner's, and we sit down, and I sell him this Blue Cross policy. And then I, and I go, yeah, you know, uh, I like to write screenplays. He goes, really, what are you working on? I'm working on something about a, gun, a blind gunslinger <laughs> based on the Zatoichi movies. He says, oh, that's pretty cool. How far into it are you? Well, I hadn't touched the script in months. I'd, I'd been too busy. I'd set it aside. And I'm trying to remember how far into it am I. I said, yeah, yeah, like 37 pages. And he goes, well, when you finish it, get it to me. And so I go home, and I check it out, and I've got like, Six pages, <laughs> and I go, oh god! So I'm starting to work on it now. He's calling me up. He says, "Where's that blind gunfire movie?" And I'm going, "I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it." And um, and so he ended up, ended up, we end up selling that to HBO, and um, it came out as Blind Justice. So that was sort of the break-ins, but that that's the weird thing is, use whatever you can use, you know, and don't do things, don't be. Like, uh, I went to my, my aunt's funeral. I had a guy who was a distant, you know, relative uh, of, of a relative. I don't know who this guy was. And he was like, you know, I was walking up the aisle to, to go, you know, to go see her in her coffin. And the guy's walking along and said to me, anyway, so what happens next? Is he's pitching me. He's pitching me at my aunt's funeral. And it's like, I don't care what you're selling. I'm never going to buy anything from you. You're horrible. You're a horrible human. I, um, so don't do that. But, you know, just to take advantage of whatever. It's like climbing up, climbing up a cliff face. You know, whatever handhold you can get, foothold you can get, you know, try to use that. And you'd be shocked at how many you have in your life. Bring us on home. How do you come up with something new, and like, should we come up with something new, or does it matter at all? New? Uh, it depends on how well, how you define new. Because you said when you when you released the Money Ball to HBO, and they said they never heard of anything like this before. 
Yeah. Like in this age, you know, everything is like so much independent media doesn't matter. It doesn't make any sense. I think that um, there's a sweet spot for new, you know. Um, if it's really something that, that, that there's sometimes there's a reason why nobody's done it before. And the reason is because it's bad. <laughs> okay? Um, if, it's, if it's too out there, they might not go for it. If it's too much straight down the middle, they might not go for it because it's too straight down the middle. So there's probably some sort of a sweet spot, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so, I mean, like I said, the main thing is whatever turns you on, whatever gets you excited, and then you just cross your fingers and hope that there's a whole bunch of people that are as messed up as you are <laughs> that will be just as excited by what you're doing. So always please yourself. It's not about them. There's no such thing as them. There is only you. You know, you are writing to entertain yourself. Your sensibilities are going to be, you're going to be sure sensibilities with a certain number of people. If you don't, then, you know, that doesn't mean you're terrible. It just means that that you're a very unique person who has a very bizarre sense of humor. I don't know what it means, but write what you love because it's the only thing that's going to be authentic at the end of the day. If you don't love it, if you're going, oh, I'm going to do this thing that's going to knock off, check off all these boxes, nobody's going to want to read that. They can see it. You can smell it, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um,